I was a born-again Christian. Gradually, for a large number of reasons, I started to question some of the assumptions that I had about the faith. Uh, for a long time, I thought that the Bible was inspired and inerrant, that there were no mistakes in the Bible. But as I engaged, I started finding mistakes in the Bible. And uh, this, this cut away, is Jesus really divine? Uh, is there really a trinity? And the idea that Jesus is God is an idea that was developed historically over time among... <laughs> Hi guys, you are welcome. Thank you so much for clicking. So this top Bible preacher left Christianity. I started out actually uh, in high school. I was a born again Christian. Uh, I uh, accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior, as we used to say, and I, I became very committed as an evangelical Christian, and I went off to Moody Bible Institute for college, which is a, a fundamentalist Bible college. After that, I went to Wheaton College, which is a liberal arts college. It's Billy Graham's alma mater. It's an evangelical school. So I had very solid evangelical Christian commitments. And uh, eventually, uh, I got a seminary degree, and I was a pastor of a Baptist church for, for a year. Um, but gradually, for a large number of reasons, I started to question some of the assumptions that I had about the faith. Uh, for a long time, I thought that the Bible was inspired and inerrant, that there were no mistakes in the Bible. But as I engaged in historical research on the Bible, as I was getting my PhD in New Testament studies at Princeton Theological Seminary, I started finding mistakes in the Bible. And uh, this, this cut away at my assumptions that the Bible was inerrant. And then I started questioning other parts of my faith. Is Jesus really divine? Uh, is there really a trinity? It was difficult. I mean, if you're raised uh, in the Christian tradition, uh, this is, forms the very heart and soul of who you are. And, uh, and leaving it uh, means leaving friends. It means uh, alienating family. It means um, uh, losing out on all sorts of social networks that you have and all sorts of beliefs that you've held dear. And so it's, it's very difficult and traumatic uh, emotionally. But my view at the time was that I was, I was in a search for what is true. And I came to believe it simply isn't true that the Bible's without error. And, it, and, uh, and the idea that Jesus is God is an idea that was developed historically over time among Christians. It wasn't something that was original to Christianity. It's a later historical development, so too the doctrine of the Trinity. And these various ideas that I had held on to, I started to realize were historical formulations. And just the existence of God himself, I finally came realized that it, uh, for me it simply didn't make sense anymore. Yeah, well this is an interesting thing that the um, you know we think when we read the Bible that we're we're obviously reading the words that Matthew wrote or that Paul wrote um, but the reality is we don't have the originals of Matthew or of Paul's letters or of any other book of the New Testament or of the Old Testament. What we have are copies of these books that were made uh, later in many cases uh, many most cases many centuries later so uh, we, the New Testament was originally written in Greek, and at present we have something like 5,500 manuscripts in Greek of the New Testament, which is a lot for an ancient book. It's far more than any other ancient book. The problem is most of these copies are hundreds and hundreds of years after the originals, and all of them have differences in them. Uh, so that the scribes who were copying these manuscripts changed the text that they were copying, uh, sometimes by accident. I mean, sometimes they just made mistakes. They were sleepy or incompetent or whatever. But sometimes it looks like scribes actually thought the text should say something other than it did, and then they, so they would change the text. Uh, some places it looks like it's a manipulation of the text, where, where the author wants to change, where, where the scribe wants to change what the author said. I mean, in many cases it may be that the scribe thought this is what the author really meant, and so he changed it. But, uh, but sometimes the, the text gets changed to say just the opposite of what it originally said. And so uh, that's, uh, that, that can be a little bit troubling, yeah. Yeah, so um, the last 12 verses of Mark are uh, they're very interesting. It, Jesus has been dead, he's been crucified, he's dead and been buried. And on the third day, he, uh, the, the third day, the women go to the tomb to see uh, about anointing his body for burial, but they find the tombs empty. Uh, Jesus isn't there. There's a young man in the tomb who says that Jesus uh, will go, that, that they're, they're supposed to go tell the disciples that Jesus will go before them and meet them in Galilee. The disciples are supposed to go to Galilee, and the women are supposed to tell them to go. And then it says the women fled from the tomb and didn't say anything to anyone because they were afraid. That's the end of Mark's gospel. It ends with the women not saying anything. Well, some scribes read this ending and thought, well, that's 
odd. I mean, the women didn't tell anybody. I mean, surely the disciples knew. And so, uh, so some scribes added a longer ending. So the last 12 verses are this longer ending where uh, the women do go tell the disciples. They do go to Galilee. Uh, Jesus does meet them there. And this is the passage where Jesus tells his disciples that if anyone believes in his name, they'll be able to speak in foreign tongues. They'll be able to handle uh, deadly snakes, and, they won't, uh, and they'll be able to drink poison, and it won't harm them. Hmm. And so this, these are the verses that the Appalachian snake handlers use to justify their ritual practice. Uh, Matthew and Luke have many of the stories in Mark, and sometimes they have the stories actually in the same words mm -hmm. as Mark. And uh, for hundreds and hundreds of years, since, uh, since the fourth century at least, uh, biblical scholars have recognized that the reason they have so many of the stories in the same words is that somebody's copying somebody else. And so the idea is usually thought that uh, Matthew and Luke actually copied some of their stories from Mark. That's why they're, they're verbatim the same uh, in so many places. One of the things that I've studied uh, in a number of my books, um, including my book Lost Christianities and in, uh, in somewhat in my book Misquoting Jesus, is this phenomenon that I call proto-Orthodox Christianity. In early Christianity, there were a variety of Christian groups that believed a variety of things. Uh, some of them that would seem wild and crazy to most Christians today. But there were battles for who would be right and who would be wrong and who would get the most converts and who would establish what the, what the standard view would be. The standard view is called orthodoxy. The word orthodoxy means the correct belief. So the people who ended up winning these battles over what to believe called themselves orthodox, meaning they had the correct beliefs, and everyone else they called heretics. Uh, a, her a heresy is a cho means choice. It's a choice not to believe the right things. And so proto-orthodoxy is what people were saying that led to orthodoxy before it was orthodoxy. Hmm. So, there's, there's what, so you have a lot of different Christian groups saying a lot of different things. One of these groups wins out uh, and calls itself orthodox. But what do you call this group before they win out? I call them proto-orthodox because they're, they're representing the views that eventually are going to triumph in Christianity. Well, there are a lot of, you know, the proto-orthodox uh, scribes are the ones who gave us these 5,500 manuscripts we have. Uh, if heretics copied the text and changed the text in a heretical way, those manuscripts apparently got destroyed. And so we have we have manuscripts then from the proto-orthodox, and sometimes they change the text in significant ways. I mean, as one example, um, there were debates in early Christianity about who Jesus was. Is he, it, was he a human being who was chosen by God? Was he, a, was he God who only seemed to be a human being? Was he both God and human? What, what was he? And uh, scribes who knew about these debates would sometimes change the Gospels in order to make the Gospels reflect their own points of view. And so one of the arguments was, is Jesus really human or not? There's this famous passage in the Gospel of Luke uh, where Jesus, before being arrested, sweat, sweats great drops as if of blood. Uh, and it's, so this is the bloody sweat. And this is where we t when people say, you know, he was sweating blood, that's what they're referring to as this passage. It turns out this passage was not originally in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, it's not in our oldest and best manuscripts of Luke. Uh, and it looks like the reason it's there now is because there were Christians who wanted to argue that Jesus was fully human. This was the orthodox view. Jesus really was human. Hmm. Well, hmm. I'm so shocked to listen to this man's stories. And you could see that it really went deeper into Christianity. And you could see his disappointment and his talking out of experience, you know, based on his research. He's giving his comment, so he spoke about why he left Christianity and why he believes that the Bible it was not in its original form. You know, he explained a whole lot about it and wow, I'm just totally speechless. You know, he said he noticed a lot of errors in the Bible, you know, a lot of repetition from different verses and it was like he was not really pleased with what he saw and how things were and that's the reason why he left Christianity. That was what his faith wanted him to accept. That was what his faith wanted him to accept because I don't know why. One thing I always say is that when it comes to religion, don't look for the fault in the religion. If the religion is impactful, you no, know, the religion has blessed you one way or the other, then why should you now start thinking of 
if there's fault or start having doubts in mind. I don't think that should be necessary. No matter how the book was written, sit down and think about it. This religion I'm into, is it for my good or bad? What have I experienced so far? If the experience you've had so far is a good one that has blessed you several ways in different dimensions, then I don't think there's a need for you to actually leave such religion. You should, you know, take your time and put your mind. Because even in this life, we have the good, we have the bad. So if we as humans, we focus on the bad things, how are we going to grow in life? How are we going to learn? There's no way you can grow. That's, that's how I see religion too. Religion too, you know, there are some times that, you know, things the way you expect, you can't expect things to be totally perfect. God is the only perfect in this world, yes. But I'm not talking about the Bible per se. I'm just saying that you can't expect life to be totally perfect. So when it comes to religion, you should, you know, give it a thought. Sit down and think about it. If you notice that, okay, this is not really helpful to you, or it has not changed your life positively, then you can go ahead and leave the religion. But if you know that religion has done so many good things in your life, you've seen the work of God in your life through that religion, then you should stay. I believe you should stay. That's it. But that was a beautiful one. So it was a beautiful video. Let me know your thoughts, guys. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.